Okay. Who's heard of closure as a language? Does anybody uh, know what family is something about it that they know? Functional, 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 Sorry, I'll just get back to uh, how did you make that happen? <laughs> the cable just fall around the wall. Tech support, it's like tech support 101. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even have to resort to that. <laughs> I'll just get my click. by this guy, invented, created, produced by this guy, Rich Hickey. Um, I can totally recommend reading or watching any talks that Rich Hickey has uh, done. So you just Google him, he's done those. If you ever get to see him uh, live, he's uh, very good. Um, and uh, he, I think it came into being a few years ago. I've certainly been playing around with it and thinking about it for at least three years, I think. Um, just before that, I was... Uh, I started thinking about um, LISPs. Uh, actually, it was a project I was on with a colleague down there, and uh, some guy came and said, oh, "Yeah, you know, you should like get into LISP. It's all really, really cool." Uh, for quite some time, I'd been trying to uh, make Emacs work for me, and so I'd heard that it was like a pretty good tool. And much in uh, Dan's vein, you know, about learning tools, I was like, oh, "I'm going to make myself learn Emacs." And Emacs has a, has a LISP built into it. So kind of all these things came together, and then uh, Closure sort of arrived, and um, got more, more into it, and for the last couple of years I've been kind of getting more into it. I, I'm quite a, a hardcore old school uh, Java programmer, uh, that's my main language, and uh, Clojure being on the JVM um, uh, makes it very easy to access uh, into this uh, strange world of Lisps uh, for us uh, Java programmers, which makes it very exciting uh, to me. Um, I certainly think, uh, I think there's a <laughs> slight uh, exaggeration in my uh, my. Uh, Basically, away from this talk, uh, and I think there was some uh, interesting tweeting from the Agile and Beach team saying it's like the most important invention uh, in the last 20 years. But I think it's really a uh, very exciting um, uh, development for us in uh, JVM, and I want to sort of uh, share some of that with you. Um, I figure the best way of doing that is to do less uh, kind of like chat about uh, why closure is so great and more uh, showing you some of the closure. Um, and so that's what I'll mostly be doing. I've got quite a lot of uh, Kind of examples uh, lined up, and so we'll start with some really basic stuff uh, and uh, see how far we get in the time. Uh, I've got it all up on uh, GitHub, the uh, thing which I should share the link with you later. So if you want to uh, follow up later, you can do. Um, <coughs> so, um, so firstly, uh, there's a, I'm going to try. I won't try and uh, give you a sort of uh, sense of what's going on in my head when I think about closure and why I think it's so cool. Uh, yeah, you might um, and uh, so, so just a little note about this bit. This is an entirely personal uh, view of the world of programming languages. I'm not uh, trying to uh, have a go at any programming languages uh, on this. Um, so, um, Um, so, different programming languages. So this, in my head, I came up with this sort of uh, metaphor about how I think about uh, different programming languages. Uh, C++ is quite complicated, but you can uh, do some really amazing things. <coughs> I, I spent quite a lot of time coding in uh, C++. All these languages I have actually coded in professionally. Yes, that's good. Um, so, uh, so I have some experience. But yeah, I spent a lot of time in my uh, young, uh, sharper days uh, playing around with uh, C++. Um, yeah, very good. Uh, 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 Ruby, uh, yes, very like um, extremely uh, destructive, but quite hard to control. Destructive in terms of being able to solve your problems. Uh, I find it that yeah, it's kind of like quite hard to control. Um, 
Python is like quite elegant and quite, you know, quite sort of uh, simple to get and use, uh, but you've got to have a certain technique to it. And then, uh, oh, Jack, well, you <laughs> 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 rely on Jack, right? It's, uh, <laughs> you're not going to get it wrong. It's kind of like, uh, not me, really, like, you probably need to switch it. But, uh, <laughs> and uh, so you might also be thinking about uh, languages on the JVM, uh, like Scott. Uh, it's an alternative to Python, which a lot of people have been getting excited about. Uh, yeah, to me, and the experience of this uh, that I've heard other people having and myself is that you know, sometimes it, you can do a lot of stuff with Scala. It's kind of a mix of OM and functional and, and kind of all this other So I wonder if anybody can guess what my, uh, with exception that people are already told, what my uh, weapon for uh, closure is. Kind of obviously, is it? So to me, like, closure is like the lightsaber of the things. It's kind of, you have to like, you kind of have to really know how to use it. You don't necessarily need to be a Jedi, but you know, we all want to be a Jedi, so uh, you can like, like think about how you like that. When you're using it, um, you feel like a Jedi. That's so let's uh, do a, a quick little bit of um, um, some just sort of boring factual things about closure. Quite a lot of people introduce closure by telling you all about the kind of philosophy of it and all of the exciting sort of theoretical aspects of it. I'm going to show you more about just how to do some straightforward things that you might be used to do. Um, but there are a few things that I think are worth calling out. I'm just going to do a bit more. Um, and these are some of them. It's, it's a functional language, as somebody pointed out. I think that's quite important, especially from this aspect of learning and trying things out. So I've found that um, getting my head around the difference between OO and functional has been a really valuable uh, learning experience for me in terms of the way I think about problems. Sometimes I've found, that just recently, the fact that solving a problem in closure uh, opened my mind to how I could then still solve the problem in the same way in OO. Um, but it helped me to sort of develop a model of how to solve the uh, problem, how to build the domain model in an interesting way because things were more natural to do in the uh, enclosure. Um, a big one is the JVM and the Java interface. So JVM not going anywhere, it's a pretty solid platform delivery. Uh, how many Java developers do you know? .NET? Not .NET. Yeah. There is actually a closure for the uh, CLR as well, so you might, well, I'm not sure quite on its state of advancement at the moment, but it's definitely there. So it's a it, it's got an abstraction layer which compiles into uh, bytecode in order to shape it more to see it. Um, and the big a big style is actually it's integrating it's a big philosophy about integration with its host environment. So with the CLI, it will have the similar I'm imagining has similar um, integration uh, depth with uh, Java, but it's particularly good at oper interoperating with Java. Uh, and you'll see a lot. It is basically written in Java. Uh, the, the implementation of the data structures are in Java. You can go and look at them on GitHub and so on. Um, so it's kind of like you can do OO stuff uh, without without needing objects. We'll see a little bit of that if we get time later. Um, and it's kind of it's a dynamic language. It's a bit like Ruby. You have a, a record which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, you can dynamically evaluate it, um, and yet you can still compile it into uh, Java classes. Um, in terms of JVM and deployment, you can build jar files just like you do with uh, Java, and you can execute them with Java minus jar. Uh, we'll hopefully see those back too. Um, some of the other, some of the sort of more uh, theoretical things, it's totally designed for concurrency, and, and in today's world, um, we're uh, beating the Moore's law by getting more and more processes rather than making the processes go fast, so that's quite a big thing, being able to uh, deal with multi processing. Uh, concurrency is good and very difficult, and so it helps if your language has it built in from the scratch. Uh, there's also um, a great community around it, it's like really catching fire, and there's a lot of really massive enthusiasm there, and I think that's quite a good thing in terms of if you want to attract uh, developers who are looking for something new, I think that could be a good, a good reason to sort of look at it. Um, I actually, I kind of think if you've got somebody who understands it, if you've got, got into the idea of what closure is, it kind of could be uh, in some ways safer and easier to learn than, than uh, OO and Java, because you don't necessarily have to learn the conceptual overhead of, uh, of OO to kind of get into it. Um, so I'm not, that's a bit of unproven, but um, that's a sort of theory. Uh, okay, so, um, so some things that you might need to, uh, okay, so this is where if you, um, if you uh, had, if you're online now, you could go to, uh, go to this place and you'll find yourself a sort of online uh, record, uh, which we'll talk about. So, how much time? 
much time? Yeah, how much time? We're going to work. I will run till 11:30, which is 50 minutes into the coffee break. So we, I've got 40 minutes. Yeah. Right. I'll try and get. I want to get to the code. Still uh, get 50 minute coffee break. Yeah. Um, so let's go run through a quick bit of theory before we go. So there's a few kind of key things that I want to uh, get in your uh, mind. Uh, so it's all about uh, being a Lisp. Uh, how many people have coded in Lisp in the past? Or so this a lot of stuff should be quite familiar to you. Um, it's all about lists. It's all about code being data and data code. We'll, we'll see that in a minute. Um, and a lot of it is about the REPL which is a sort of dynamic way of evaluating code. And because code is data, so closure, the essential loop that goes in is it reads, uh, you have a reader, it reads in some strings, which are lists of things, and then it turns them into a data structure, and it executes them. And then we'll see the REPL. Um, and there's a few things that, data structures that are very important to us. Um, Vectors. Vectors are indicated with uh, square brackets. Now, in the normal list, there's not lists uh, like common list. There's not much difference between lists and functions, and which are lists of things. Um, and so you don't really have square brackets. There's a difference in those. So two. We'll see that in a second. Um, but that's a that's vector. Now we're back to the things. Uh, you have maps of things, which are in curly brackets with uh, keywords. Uh, notice there's no commas. A bit like Ruby, you can put the commas in if you want, but you don't have to, you have to either. Uh, yeah, maps and strings. You can have lists of maps. Uh, and functions. So functions are basically lists of symbols. Uh, it's, they're a bit special when it sees the curly, uh, sorry, the straight parentheses. Um, it treats this first thing as the function. Uh, does anybody even uh, think you can guess what this is going to do? What does any answer to me? Yes. <coughs> uh, what about this one? Ten and this one? What about that one? Yes. So uh, this one's a bit. The other ones read quite nice, right? Like add two and one. And this is like I, I will read this as uh, take away from two, one. It sort of doesn't quite read quite as well, but it, it's basically it works. And it. it um, Kind of makes more sense because it's a list of things. You can have more things down there, right? So you can say take away from ten, two, and three, right? And so it sort of fits. So that's actually fine. Which you could write as take away from ten, add two and three together. So this is where we get into this, maybe if you're not used to a functional uh, and listy world, this is where the mind bending kind of starts. Um, so is that, anybody, is that bending anybody's minds, or is it sort of got it even feel? So that's also, uh, there's a sort of um, kind of place to way of doing things. Right. So that's functions and data structures. What about this? What do you think that's going to produce? Does anybody know list speed people? Does that make, that's a bit familiar to this. Yeah. <laughs> so this, this is a common experience in learning closure. Like, you do something like that. <laughs> Now especially for um, so this it means uh, it's like it's, interpret this as a literal statement. So we're before without that, it was saying this is a function, so I'm going to treat this as the function name, and then I'm going to pass it all the parameters that it. That says just treat it as a data structure. And actually, what it's saying is that this minus thing is actually a function, and it lives in this uh, namespace, which is very similar to package in Java. So closure.call is like this equivalent of a package in Java, and it's this function. And the functions have no uh, restrictions on what they can be called, I and mean, it's probably some symbols. So you can have a function called minus. Uh, and so if you're being functional, everything is a function, and everything is a list. That's pretty much all you need to know. Um, so that's a bit of a summary. And in a, in a sort of traditional list, they don't tend to have this, so you tend to do this a lot. So when you want to have a vector, you have to put that sort of thing, and that's why they rich put in these uh, square brackets, so that essentially you're not always type in this escape. And it means there's less uh, braces, braces, which is a common thing that people imagine about closure that or at least that's all about closing. That's it. Okay, so that, that's enough uh, pre-flight training. Um, so kind of part of the sort of philosophy of this is that uh, 
How many people think code is really difficult to learn or less is complicated? Hard. Yeah, because there's, I think there's a sort of impression there's quite a hard learning curve to it, right? That it's sort of, it's difficult, complex, quite hard. So I'm hoping to kind of show that there's quite a lot of stuff which is quite easy about it. You can get going pretty quickly if you understand a few uh, sort of core concepts like those. Uh, and then there's a whole heap of stuff to learn. Right? So it's like it's like the taking uh, Dan's uh, metaphor of the concept here. So, you know, because the keys are quite straightforward. You know, it's quite easy to make a noise on the piano. You've got a couple of keys. Coming a concept here is that you can go on for the rest of your life learning all the stuff. So uh, now I'm going to try something here. This is, uh, this is Emacs in action here as well, so I'm not going to talk about Emacs, that's a whole other uh, world of fun. Uh, so let's do some um, really simple things. Now is this what's going on here? This is the REPL. Uh, so I can type things in, I can press return, and it will do so, it will execute closure code. Um, uh, Emacs has this very nice uh, thing, which is kind of in some other ideas. Right? You can also get a plugin for IntelliJ, if you're interested, or you can uh, try along on the uh, Web REPL, <laughs> if you like. It's got this nice feature where I can't type a single parenthesis, right? So it's going to keep closing, closing them off for me. Um, it also does this nice thing where it changes the color of them uh, so I know which, which depth I'm at, which is kind of handy, and it highlights. Uh, well, so that's just one of the smaller. That's probably the, one of the uh, key things about the Emacs integration that makes it really uh, joyous to work with. Uh, Okay, so let's do some of the things that we were. Um, so I think if anybody's got sort of questions as we go, just like shout them out. Um, uh, I'm not uh, a massive expert at closure, so then, is anybody else here a closure head? Like, who's been doing closure long? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of on my own if you get that answer. <laughs> so I can phone Rich. You know, you like a really quick overview about functional programming and objects and things. I think I'm happy with that a lot. I think you'll see some of that. I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, Functional versus IRO in the uh, talk we were sort of doing in, uh, in code. Right? Um, but yeah, it might be worth to say so. Uh, functional programming is so to me the, the difference is the unit of or the smallest unit of the code a composition is a function, whereas in an, in OO the smallest unit of composition is the object. Right. So you you can't really build anything, especially in something like in Ruby particularly, like purely OO. Oh, I understand that's not quite true. Yeah, so you can have like functions on their own. Um, in Java, for example, you can have static methods, but they still live inside a class, right? So you can't escape the class. Yeah. Uh, in functional, you can escape the class. That's the thing. Uh, but in closure, you also have some of the other things that we used to in OO, like polymorphism. And if we get time, I'll try and show you that. Otherwise, uh, I'll show you. OK, so uh, what's this going to do? Is. Everything in the world, the laws of physics are uh, um, working. So 10 plus 2, 3, 5. So all the things that we saw on that thing. Uh, now, okay, so this is going to do a bit of like jar thing. So what's the um, first thing we always do in any. Uh, um, Okay, great. Um, let's see some other stuff that we're quite familiar with. So I'm going to go quite quickly through all of this, so uh, so we get on to some more juicy stuff. But just uh, give you a bit of a flavour of the kind of what's the meal? Ah, so that's a good, good question. Um, so 
So this bit, the green bit, is the system out, right? So that's just standard normal Java stuff. Print out an empty is just is actually the Java print function. Um, this is the result of calling that function, right? So because print ln doesn't return anything, it's nil. Uh, let's I'll show you that soon. So what about um, it's a bit boring, isn't it? Hello world. So uh, like we might do in Java, format string not format. Uh, Anyone want to give me that? Nice. Nice. <laughs> so in that case, the result is uh, okay. And um, I think Dan was talking about some kind of crazy thing about pure functions and whatever, and he's talking about. So that's the difference between that. Like pure function and impure function, as far as I understand. Um, you know, so this guy has no side effects. Right? So it's just all it does is return something. The previous one. Uh, print and actually had this sort of side effect of printing something out to the outside world. Uh, so as as much as we can, working with um, pure functions which don't have side effects is going to be much easier for us to compose uh, and kind of like up to a bit of functional. But you kind of don't really need to know that to get going. So then we can do some other cool stuff like if I get that. Uh, I can do this. Still big enough. So I've seen some. Uh, I don't know if you can see the uh, magic going on there. That's, that's quite good. So um, Emacs also has this uh, nice feature where I can sort of they call it slurping and barfing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, um, so it's all about the fun. Uh, um, so. Yeah, I can move this parenthesis uh, out there and kind of like include function, which is very useful when you're dealing with uh, this thing. So one of the things that um, after a while your mind kind of like gets into is that closure is a very homo-iconic language. So in Java, if you think about it, there's lots of different forms, right? So you've got uh, packages, classes, methods, variables, you know, like member variables and you've got like modifiers and, and all of this. Uh, in closure, you just have lists, right? That's it, pretty much. Vectors and maps, what we saw before. Um, so there's kind of there's kind of less uh, conceptual overhead to learn. There's a much simpler sort of core to the language, but then you can do all these kind of like crazy things with it. So after a while, you kind of get into the, or I've been getting into the kind of um, elegance of uh, only having this kind of one way of doing things. Uh, so things start looking uh, okay, so we can do that as well, so we're back to that. Um, so I'm going to... Let's, let's make our own function, that would be quite exciting. It's going to be <coughs> quite useful to us. Um, and the way to do that is... Can you not see that well enough? Is it not too low? Um, is this thing... Uh, is this thing the uh, def function? Def -bank? Um, and uh, oh look, here's a bit of Java I'm using here. Right? So uh, this is so static methods are like functions, so we can call those really easily from Clojure. So I just well, obviously I don't recommend using this function in the uh, live code, um, but uh, yeah, just to show you. What's going on. Uh, so that's a quite nice feature. So now it's created this function for me. I'm in this user namespace, which is kind of like your default namespace. So a bit like you know, in Java, you can have that package it doesn't exist. Um, you can never go in there. Uh, and then we can do <coughs> Brilliant. We can uh, create functions and we can call Java. That's pretty awesome. Um, so there's some other things that uh, are quite nice. It's, there's, this is a sort of built in. Yeah. What's yeah. the result if you put a string as the argument? Okay. Ah, you're going to expose one of the interesting <laughs> things, right? So. Oh, that's interesting, right? So this is a, it's actually, oh, it can use the concept. There's a Java exception, right? 
Uh, and so that's interesting. So that's a kind of uh, so it's cool because basically underneath everything is Java. So you, when you see things go wrong, you're going to get uh, Java exceptions, um, and you can raise Java exceptions and, and create them yourself and do them. One of the uh, kind of downsides is because it's running on top of Java. Um, sometimes you get these quite crazy stack traces. Uh, so if you try and do things with lists, you'll see like sort of 20 lot, 20, 30 uh, line stack traces. Hopefully you won't see any uh, today because I've kind of practiced what I'm doing. Um, and so that can be a little bit tricky to, uh, to understand. It's back to the previous slide of what is that. <laughs> um, but after a while, it, it can kind of get into it. Um, OK, so let's do one to two. This one. Uh, so this this is quite useful when you're sort of playing around these kind of things. It's just a, a bit of function called time, which um, hopefully tells us that that took kind of one second. Um, and so now we're seeing something that's quite interesting about uh, the composable nature of a functional list, but different functional style. Well. Um, it's quite easy for us to have these sort of functions and then compose them together and sort of like decorating uh, functions. That we do that quite a lot. Um, and so I think that's one of the, if you go kind of like <coughs> back in time to the, uh, the, the desires of what we wanted programming to be all about, it's all about composability and reuse. Right? So um, it's a lot easier to reuse functions than it is to reuse domain specific abstractions like in OO. Uh, so for example, in OO, um, it's quite common to build kind of like micro classes or you know, sort of like say micro types. Are we familiar with that? So instead of having a list, I'm going to have a list of customers or a customer list. And it's going to have specific methods on it which says, get me the first customer that I'm using And so you're building a lot of domain specific abstractions. In uh, Clojure uh, or functional world, in this particularly, um, it's all about the data structures to say. There's only like three data structures, lists, maps, vectors. Uh, and it's all about the functions that operate on those. Um, and the sort of theory is uh, best to have like a few solid abstractions and then lots of functions that operate on those rather than have lots of domain specific abstractions. Which makes it easier to reuse and compose things. Maybe see a bit of that. Um, okay, so some other like quite nice things I thought I'd like to show. Uh, this guy is pretty cool, it's a funny name, but um, it's back to the slurping again. Is uh, <laughs> now spitting. <laughs> slurping and spitting. Um, so basically, this, this function just it does all the sort of boring work um, of putting something into a into a file, um, and similarly you can uh, slurp it back in. And this is, I suppose, this is a bit about the sort of general design philosophy in Clojure. Is that you seem to find because it's easy to compose things and build these, these functional sort of, it's very easy to write functions, very easy to talk Java, you find a lot of the libraries are basically wrappers for existing Java libraries that you're already familiar with. I mean, there's already heaps of those out there. So there's this kind of like huge explosion of um, closure libraries where people have just taken existing Java libs and written basically kind of like DSLs for them in closure. So it's actually it could also be um, a potential uh, way to kind of get into it. So you've got an existing, some existing code, quite uh, complex OO sort of that's basic to them, and you could build a quite it's kind of like higher level uh, language, if you like, in Clojure that allows you to uh, talk to them in a sort of more meaningful way. So, you know, obviously spit underneath is using the Java, um, you know, IO libraries, and we all know what those like, and we have like commons IO, like so it has static methods on to do this kind of stuff. Clojure has learned from all that stuff, and you, you kind of like get it for free. And so some basic stuff. You can, if you want, there's, there's deeper libraries where you can get more into it. But it's kind of this philosophy of giving you like easy access to things that you want to do. So that's quite a nice uh, thing. Uh, and just uh, another thing that I seem to end up doing quite a lot is um, loading things from um, class file. Uh, and, and there you see this whole mixture of uh, Java. So here's a built-in closure wrapper for some Java stuff, right? So there's the the resource uh, object in Java uh, and the Clojure core libraries um, have this Java I/O wrapping wrapping functions. Um, so anytime you want to do anything with like Java I/O stuff, there'll probably be a function in the Clojure Java I/O. Uh, that's good. Okay. So that's like 
uh, really basic stuff. Um, okay. I'm going to show you some stuff about um, this or collections. So in closure, collections are kind of called sequences. Um, another functional um, kind of theoretical thing is about sort of um, lazy sequences. So sequences that don't actually exist yet. So it's kind of complex things on the spot. I'm not going to go into all the details of that, but we'll sort of show you a few things and see what's going on. Um, so there's another construct here. So def is a bit like declare me something with a name, like a variable. Not really a variable, it's a constant in this case. Um, and this uh, function range uh, is a, it basically produces an infinite sequence. So a bit more mind bending there. So so that what what is integers? Um, now if I was just to type integers there, in theory it would show me all of the integers in the world. I should kill my computer for going endlessly trying to calculate them. Um, so uh, what you can do is um, take twenty. That's actually right, because it hasn't taken like it hasn't worked out all the interesting things. It's just worked, it's just iterated the sequence and brought me back the things that I wanted, which is basically uh, kind of lazy uh, collection. Um, so some other stuff that we can do, which is useful. Uh, sort them, uh, and that's that's like another function which is just happens to be greater than. So basically, yeah, I'll put them in the. Uh, in so reverse order. <coughs> Sorry. No, uh, so the range, what, what does that mean exactly? That, that range is a function. Um, I think. Oh, yeah, I've got some help here. So you can do this as well. So range one, two, three. Give me 30. If I didn't have any parameters, now I hope that my REFL is sensible enough to stop after a certain amount of time. Not. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I'm doing that now, it's gone off. It's like whole integers here. Whole integers, that range. Sorry, I've just got a bit. Okay, yeah. Basically, it's trying to generate integers. Um, Actually, is, is it integers defined as the function range, or is it defined as an, an infinite list? There'll be a loop in there somewhere. That's kind of <laughs> going over and over and over. I, I might have to restart now, yeah. How you got out of range? So oh, yeah, okay. Um, you yeah, okay. I remember, yeah, exactly. So it went into Java. So if you redefine range as integers, then is that um, called? So yes, I just, I, yeah, ah, okay, yeah, good, good. good. So some more laziness going on. Right? So when I say def integers range, it didn't come off forever, did it? Like, it just said, Declare this thing called integers as being this sequence. So these um, lazy sequences don't do anything until you perform some action on them that makes them give up their stuff. Right? So just um, because I did it in the REPL, the REPL was trying to print out the result of the function for rate to rate, right? Whereas when I did it in the DEF, nobody was trying to do anything with the result. And if I just printed out, if I just tried to do this, it would be the same thing. Because then it's waiting, it hasn't done anything yet. That's why it's lazy. It's like hiding the Yeah, retired, it's like a cat. I mean, it's really good. I could have done a clever example with like cats and boxes or something. Um, uh, so that's good, it came back, it ran out of memory, that's good. Um, I think there's something you can say. Now, well, another interesting thing, I don't know if this works, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, you've got to set your record up right. Um, you can you? Yeah, sorry, that was right. But you can at least, so you can usually, um, there's this sort of built-in function like source, which tells you what the actual um, declaration of the method of uh, the function is. And uh, this doc, which tells you some documentation. So there you go, so lazy sequences. Um, a step. So that's kind of useful, just generally. Um, okay, let's, I, I want to get on to next bit, so I'll just show you quickly a few more things. And so, I don't know, so use, like, there's some, quite a lot of libraries around now that do this kind of stuff, like functional, uh, which like, list comprehension, so Python does it already, and you know, that kind of thing. So this is basically another thing, a functional thing. 
uh, programming. Um, and there's some ones in uh, Java even now, like Totally Lazy. Uh, um, let you do this kind of thing without having to. So normally what you do is um, like kind of iterate over and then pass in the filter. Um, so here, filter uh, the old things from, so old question mark, that's just a sort of convention um, in the naming of the uh, method function. Uh, just say it's going to be a Boolean type thing. Um, you use P for that. An old this bit, you an old P. Ah, right, yeah. yeah. Uh, you can do that. Um, so this filter thing is basically saying, uh, filter is a function. Uh, ah, and here we go. So this is like uh, kind of like sort of idle function. Sort of idea. So this is take a, a function which takes a function, right? And then applies it to another thing. So it's a bit more sort of functional. Field. Um, so it's gonna, it does basically say, use this function even, go over all of the things in this collection of the 20 integers and, and apply it to it and filter me back the ones that, that match that test. Uh, okay, so more mind bending. Uh, okay, what's going on? So this is the thing that uh, Java's been uh, cover coveting for many years, the, uh, the closure. Um, it's a, a, a uh, and so this is like anonymous uh, functions. Um, and I happen to have a plugin in, uh, in uh, Emacs which turns them into a nice little lambda symbol. Uh, you can actually type fn for that. Um, and basically I'm sort of declaring a function in line there. And so that's saying, uh, give me the odd things that are divided by, by visible by three. Uh, okay. Right, so not really, so, yeah, there's some more things. Uh, yeah, I'm not so, uh, okay, so I think you can have a, you can have a, a choice in the path. Um, we can either look at more sort of detail about what you can do with kind of collections, um, which will be kind of just a bit more of the same but more complex, or we can switch to um, looking at things something like a bit more useful. And the example I've got is how to build a uh, like REST API over Mongo. Uh, so uh, more collections, uh, hands up. <laughs> REST API over Mongo. <laughs> uh, okay, so. <laughs> So for this, I'm not going to um, just like type stuff in. I'm going to do more sort of uh, showing you uh, the code. Um, so why they here? Okay, I'm going to mirror. I'm going to try and mirror it the display. Okay, so what does the equal zero mean? Sorry. So it's, it's, like, it's like when the modulus of x and 3 right. is equal to 0. Oh, right. uh, so that's the thing, so you have to sort of uh, read it from yeah. that side a bit more. Yeah, yeah it starts in the right side. But presumably those, that lambda is a proper lambda, like it's got access to variables on the window outside. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's an interesting point. I'm not entirely sure, but I don't know. It doesn't. It's encapsulated. Inside that, it's only what you've passed in through the right. So it's just a it's just a function, not a closure. It's a pure function. So why is it called closure? I might have just been using that term incorrectly. I was thinking that closure. The whole language that called closure. So yeah, with an S. Yeah, I was. <laughs> I may be using terms uh, slightly uh, incorrectly. Because there was um, no way to put a J in the word function. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I understand it. There are lots of x's as well. So you've got one put multiplication. Is that the first one in the square brackets? Yeah, so x is the, so that's a, declare a, an anonymous function inside here. And in, in this little sort of closure the world. And uh, it's going to take x, and then you can use x within that. It's exact, I could have that entirely somewhere else called den function. It's a bit like anonymous. Um, as well. but, you know, when you do new in Java and you implement an interface in line of set. Um, right now, what I need to do is work out how to be. Um, is that the same compiler? Or is it just 
drive the seat. Good question, I'm not sure. It somehow makes white code. <laughs> um, I'm not entirely sure how. Um, it, but uh, I'll show you a bit of that actually just now because that's what we need to do. Good. Um, okay, so this is, in order to be able to do something a bit more um, powerful, you're going to need to bring in some uh, libraries. So you have this thing like project.clj. It's a closure um, file. Um, it's a little bit like your Maven or your Gradle file. In fact, it uses the same underlying sort of dependency uh, kind of structures as Maven or Ivy. You can use that. Except you don't have to write it in XML. You can write it in nice closure. Um, and this is basically um, a sort of DSL for doing it. And, and um, Jim, is that a closure thing or is that a lining thing? Good question. So there's the, there's a build tool called lining them, which is a, the equivalent of Maven in the uh, closure world. Um, in the world. And um, it's basically a tool built on closure, exactly like it like. And it, it defined this syntax. You have, you have a class of pump file as well. Um, so it works very similar to your um, pod file. Right. So the, they will get downloaded into your Maven repository just the same way. So there's a, there's a command, uh, so Lonigan, uh, uh, you do by uh, Lonigan something. I don't know if that's why it's saying that. So they, and it's, you know, very familiar from a sort of uh, maven uh, Gradle type thing, build and thing. And, um, one of the things you can do is lay gaps. Goes up all those way of downloads of the world. Uh, like um, so, so here I've included uh, quite a lot of other libraries. This is just a sort of format. So it's basically this, it's like the coordinate system from Maven, right? So you've got the name of the project, the version, um, all that sort of stuff. You can exclude things. Um, there's a few <coughs> other things here that basically tells it which things you run when it's running as a sharp one. Um, okay, let's, let's look at the server thing. Um, so, so this is our server. Um, so here, this is a bit like, so NS is like your namespace, like your package, um, use and require. There's some subtleties there, I won't go into them right now, but they're basically like imports. Um, so I'm importing a whole heap of things. Uh, Composure is a framework, or a, sorry, a library uh, written in Closure that uh, wraps basically um, Jetty. Uh, have you known Jetty? It's like a, a lightweight um, web container, uh, web server for Java. Um, and you can think of uh, Ring is very similar to uh, Ruby has the, what's that thing called in Ruby? Right. Yeah, ring, ring rack. So, so actually, this, this when you're using Composure, it's very like uh, Sinatra in Ruby. Um, it's a kind of similar thing, so it's very functional. So basically, you have this thing which declares your um, list of all of the routes that the app is going to respond to. Um, I happen to have put what happens when something gets invoked on there into a, a file called views, um, which has, which I've sort of, uh, which I've given the name feed. So let's look at um, this one. This is the simplest thing. Um, so this guy, when I take a get on the root, uh, I'm going to use the parameter of request. And this is where you start getting cool with closure, right? Because there's no request object like there is in Java. It's just a map. And the significance of that is quite subtle because it comes back to this thing about having just one data structure and lots of functions operating on it. Because you don't have to be um, coupled to the actual domain to the interface, it gets quite powerful. Um, I'm running out a bit out of time. Yes, so I managed to. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, I'm going to show you the Mongo view of this. Uh, and of course, there's a, uh, a Mongo library, uh, which um, some of you probably uses some Java underneath. Um, and So here's a couple of interesting things. So this guy is the function that's going to get called when you uh, do the slash. 
And uh, nicely, this is where we get to code is data and data is code. My, my data, in this case, I've just made it. This is my index page. It's pretty much static all the time. So I just shove a map right there in the function. And because of the, um, this array map makes it stay in the same order. Um, but essentially, I'm just putting, I can type the data right in there. And it sort of melds in nicely with my uh, code. Funny, we tried to create a map in uh, Java, for example. You have to start building kind of like fluent APIs for it. And you can't just like type it here as a map. Um, so that's just by turning that. And then this guy is, so I thought I'd do a sort of demonstration of uh, a conference registration, uh, appropriate. And uh, it's got uh, some attendees. Um, you can return a list of them and you can post a new attendee, like right? some pretty standard uh, things you might want to do with an API. Um, blah, blah, blah. And what's interesting here is this bit. This is the bit that goes to Mongo. I'll show you the thing working first of all. <coughs> Three minutes left. Um, the Mongo stuff's not that complicated. It's based, and what's beautiful is because everything's about maps and JSON, it's all very intimate, intimately, there's no impedance mismatch between them. And so you're basically getting a map back from. Mongo, giving it back to the JSON formatter, which is this, uh, just using um, Cheshire. Uh, and so there's, there's very little impedance. So you're just dealing with maps all the time. There's no, there's no um, attendee object, and there's no attendee DTO, and then, a, then one for the Hibernate object, and one for, and one for the going back to the thing. And there's no annotations which tell you this is a joke. It's just it's all just maps, which makes it very lightweight um, for working with this kind of stuff. Uh, right, let's at least run it for. Uh, uh, now, the way we uh, run it is. Uh, um, right, uh, and that looks pretty familiar to anybody who's used uh, Jetty. It is exactly, it is Jetty, uh, and it's using uh, Log4j to output stuff, so it's all kind of familiar stuff. And then hopefully. Uh, right, it's good. Um, and so here we have a nice like uh, website. Nice, nicely. Uh, quite familiar. Uh, oh, so we've got. Um, oh, look, we've got something for. Uh, so I can look at my list of attendees. Oh, there's no attendees in the list on there. Um, I've created a, a little uh, form. Um, what's another nice little? Um, a nice little um, thing because of this map thing again. Um, there's no, so there's no, none of these all these sort of mainstream objects in the way. So actually, if I post a URL encoded form, the the backend code doesn't really see that as any real difference to me posting some JSON with AJAX. So to get going, I'll just literally um, post it that as long as I've named the. Uh, Um, and uh, that, that structure is that something that the server is formatted? Or is that that's my uh, structure. I've, I've invented that uh, structure. I I manipulated the data coming back from Mongo to add. So this um, <coughs> thing is a uh, is a way of identifying types. In, uh, it's a sort of um, it's not a, a mind type thing. It's just something. Sort of loads of local protocol. But basically, the, oh, and this is um, JSON view, it's just uh, a plugin for Chrome, which makes it look oh, right. pretty nice. Yeah, so it does all this stuff. Yeah, no, I haven't. So it's actually, you're returning JSON. Then. Yes, yeah. sorry, yes. Yeah. So Chrome is I'm so used to using JSON view that I forgot that it might be okay. uh, an obvious. Yeah, so that's JSON view, so it's just returning JSON uh, straight from Mongo and tidying up. Uh, and and I kind of, I coded that up on the train sort of yesterday, in like an hour or so. Um, so that's about all we've got time for. Um, I just hope I've given you a sort of brief flavor of some of the things that you can do. And that it's actually pretty, not as maybe hard as you might think to get going. And actually you can do some pretty useful stuff uh, very quickly with it. Um, and if you want to like ask any more detailed questions, please come and uh, grab me out of the Can we have the source question? Yeah, I uh, oh, no, that's it. Yeah. Well, Jim, that's just 
thank Jim in the usual way. Hey. Uh, Marcin, on the art of feedback, you've got 15 minutes now for some coffee.